All right, so in this video, I wanna go over how you can set yourself up to have a successful quant finance project uh, and maybe use that as a bit of a resume booster. And I have this video broken down into three separate parts. First is why I think it's worth your time to do projects, what and how to approach them, what to do and how to approach them, and then selling them because this can be just as important. Uh, how do you sell them to a technical and non-technical audience? And by selling, I mean sort of marketing them and you know showing that you learned something from them and making them uh, improve your profile overall. Now, of course, not selling them financially. I don't mean. Um, so, in terms of the why, you know, there are some objections to why you might not want to do a project. Uh, the impact on resume can be low. A lot of people don't see a project and just hire you because of that, right? So it's not the case that if you have some really good project, you're guaranteed to get hired. Um, and in a lot of scenarios, it can not even matter at all, right? So why would you spend all your time on this? Uh, second point being that they, of course, are very time consuming. A good project should not be something that looks like you spent a couple hours uh, every afternoon for a week to come up with and do. A good project should look like it at least took a month. I mean, it really, it should look like it took a long time, in my opinion. Um, because think about it like this. If you have, say, 15% of your resume allocated to something that took you, I don't know, 10 hours, well, what does that say about your total resume? It says that you, know, you don't have a lot of time uh, put into the things that you're willing to use uh, that real estate on the resume for. So uh, be conscious of that, in my opinion. And then it requires a lot of technical context. So to identify a gap in either implementation or in, let's say, uh, the efficacy of some model for a particular set of financial instruments, it requires a lot of background knowledge and knowledge about what people are already doing um, that you may not have. Okay, so this is sort of the case against doing a project. Now, why do I think you should do it? Well, First is because I think that interest makes having projects effectively inevitable. Uh, because if you're really interested in the space, you are going to spend some of your free time looking into these things or trying to do some things or come up with a new way of approaching a problem. So if you're truly interested in the space, I think it's inevitable that you will have something that you can package up into a project. Uh, second is it is and should be a productive, fun endeavor. It can be frustrating at times, but Overall, it shouldn't feel like something that's so awful. Uh, third is that it's accessible to anyone. So even if it's a small resume boost, it's something anyone can do, right? Not anyone can go back and change where they went to school or change their GPA that they had in school or change their work experience on the fly. Uh, those are much more um, tall asks, even though they will have probably a larger impact than projects. It's projects are something that anyone can do and add to their resume. Uh, and I think this is the most important point, maybe actually, is that the real learning happens here. The real, learn, real learning doesn't happen when you're on a, a tight deadline. It doesn't happen when you're doing textbook problems for a class. It happens when you come up with an idea, you sit there, you work through it, and you know you have the time to spend deeply diving into something. Uh, so even from a personal growth perspective, I think it's important to have some sort of project that you want to work on. And at the end of the day, if these projects feel like such a hassle for you, I don't think this uh, in general is the field for you, not quant, but I mean, say you're doing an art project or you're doing a math project or something. If that project is so uh, awful to you, you don't enjoy the process, then that field is probably not for you. Do something that you will enjoy so that you can excel at it as opposed to just um, scraping by. Okay, but let's say I have convinced you to consider doing a project. The first thing people ask is, what do I do for a project? And I don't think this is the right approach. You should have the context. The goal should be to have the context to be able to synthesize a project idea for yourself. So you don't want to be just dictated some project because that's going to be inherently surface level and probably a bunch of people have already done it, right? So I have this project selection process and it's built out of four steps. And again, I don't think this is really particular to quant either. Uh, this is really for any sort of technical topic. So the first thing you need to do is familiarize yourself with the background knowledge. And for any research or not even necessarily research endeavor, this is step one, right? You need to know what people are already doing. 
and you need to familiarize yourself with any background knowledge. For example, you can't approach some derivative pricing thing if you don't have your calculus down, right? Uh, so that's important. Next is in the process of one, you should find something which piqued your interest and maybe stands out as needing improvement, right? So you should select something that's interesting to you again, so that this doesn't feel like such a, a task that you hate doing. Um, and once you pick that thing that piques your interest, dive deep on that. Really uh, get particular here, get niche down here. And I have some examples below. Uh, so this feels very abstract now, but I will concretize it with dev and research example in a second. And then four is to find the pitfalls in the current approach and then address those in some way, in some small way. I'm not saying you have to rebuild some massive generalized framework, but try and find one particular use case that you can improve it for. And so let's step out of the abstract and go into the, the more concrete. So here's a quant dev example. Let's say you familiarize yourself with your language and the popular pack packages in your language of choice. <clears throat> Let's say one of those is stats models, and you see that their ARIMA model implementation leaves a lot to be desired, or you want to add some features to it, or you want the solver to be more robust, something like this, right? You have to select this for yourself, and this will come from knowing a lot about the space and using things for yourself. and after that exposure, it will be obvious to you, you know, oh, I wish this thing was better. Okay. So say that's the option, then what you do is, of course, you dive deep into the current implementations, you look at other implementations of let's say this ARIMA model in different languages and see what have they done. Um, and you know, again, what are the consistencies across the board where you could maybe improve things. And then step four is to carry that out. It's to draft and implement your own version, which has some sort of additional benefit. Again, it doesn't have to be super general, but maybe you have performance improvements for a very niche use case, or you have integrated it into common workflows, so it's very easy to adopt your implementation. Or third, it could be you have some additional features, you've extended the model, and fundamentally, you've done something that's not present in these other packages. So that's a good quant dev example. In terms of a quant research example, well, what happened there? Let's say you uh, pick up a textbook on volatility surface methods, right? And the concept of local volatility is very interesting to you. So then maybe you do a deep dive on SVI models. And that's, you know, the thing that you find really, really interesting. So you look at how those are um, used to fit uh, save all surfaces to some exotic financial instruments. And then you find some where it doesn't perform so well. Let's say the fit is bad, or let's say it's very hard to optimize the parameters, the current solvers, again, similar to over here, are not robust or something like that. Or maybe it's just very computationally expensive. Well, then you see how this process generates for you the project, right? You fix this now, that's your goal. You fix it for a very niche use case, again, start small, and make it something that's approachable to you in a few month window. So this whole uh, thing here, I think is the most valuable part of the video. It's, you know, don't just ask for a project, get familiar enough with the space that you come up with a project idea, because that's one, it demonstrates that you're sort of a self starter, and you're able to think in that way. Uh, and two, it's going to make your project inherently unique compared to what other people are doing. Okay. And now the final step is on selling the project. So this is important because for the project to do as much as it can for you on your resume, you need to make it appeal to two audiences. One is a non-technical reviewer who may be doing some initial resume screening. And two will be the technical reviewer who maybe asks you about this in an in-person interview. And this is kind of difficult because there are sort of contradictory things that would appeal to these two different groups. So the non-technical reviewer is probably going to be looking for keywords that are relevant to the job description. It may be impressive sounding metrics um, and maybe this kind of cringy XYZ style bullet points where you have your accomplishment X, the measurement by which you sort of measure this accomplishment Y, and then the approach and methodology Z. So it's very formulaic, it's kind of surface level. Um, and what a technical person is going to care about much more is the depth of knowledge um, associated with your project. It's kind of self-explanatory, right? The 
person who knows the space well is going to be more interested in the depth than the surface level. They're going to be interested in your interest. So it's great to have some surface level project, but if you can't answer basic questions about why you did this, why you selected things that you chose to do, it comes across like you just wanted to do this to fill out some space on a resume. And you don't want it to come across that way. So really think deeply about the project that you, you get into. And, uh, you know, of course, it has to have the technical skills in there. So it should signal that you are like uh, your technical skills are up to par. And again, the challenge here is that appealing to these two groups can be contradictory. So I have an example here. This is an example that I think is good for a non-technical review stage, but bad for the technical review stage. So let's say you've done forecasting stock prices, right? <clears throat> uh, everyone does this and it's an immediate eye roll, I think. But maybe someone who uh, is not technical sees this and thinks it's a fun project idea. Maybe you've used some fancy transformer architecture that you found in a paper uh, and you have PyTorch in there. So you're hitting the buzzwords, transformers in there, LLMs, everything that, you know, sounds buzzwordy. You trained on the MAG7, you got this big sharp ratio over 10 years of backtesting data, and you use some filtering approach for regime detection. I think to a non-technical person, this sounds very appealing. It sounds like, you know, you have the good metrics in there, you have the buzzwords, and you've, you know, it's a, it's a multifaceted project. But why is this bad for the technical reviewer? It's because, I mean, the first thing is forecasting stock prices is the number one basic and low effort project that, that everyone does. It's the first thing that comes to mind, right? It, oh, finance, why not predict the price of the stock? It's like very level one thinking, and it's not a good project topic. Uh, two is it sounds like you just copy pasted some fancy GitHub repo that implemented this architecture. So again, think about what the technical person is going to think um, and try to make it seem like there's some depth to the project. There's no justification for the model selection, right? It seems like you just picked this. Why? Who knows? Um, and probably you don't have a good answer to that if you've just tried one model. Uh, for data set is small, very basic. It's like, okay, you've taken price data for 10 years for seven instruments. You know, that's what? Um, maybe, I don't know, uh, 17,000 data points, something like this. It's not very impressive. Um, and it sounds like you're just, again, copy pasting buzzwords to make it sound fancy. Uh, and again, think about the time that you're signaling you've spent on this. This is something anyone could do in an afternoon. I can get this data in 20 minutes. I can copy paste someone's transformer architecture in 20 minutes, and I can spin up Kalman filter in Python again in 20 minutes. So this is like, this whole project could be done in an afternoon. And so how do you improve something like this? Uh, first would be to select a better project, but for the purposes of this example, let's stick with this project. But again, just select something uh, better. First would be, okay, let me kind of uh, bring these side by side. So you use this fancy transformer architecture, but why, right? Have some legitimate model selection pipeline and make it clear that you don't just pick models off the shelf because they sound cool. Two, maybe you penalize senseless model complexity. I think this is one of the number one things that you see in people who are uh, first getting into the spaces. They want to use the most fancy model possible, but in a real business setting, Nobody, I mean, you don't want that much complexity if it's not needed. So ideally, a simpler model would be better. Uh, and it also signals more generally like fundamental knowledge as opposed to you've skipped all the fundamentals and you're just like doing transformers for some reason. And then maybe you have something, you know, if you were to stick with this approach, you have some dynamic stock universe that's based on like liquidity over some uh, rolling window of the history of this underlying asset. Okay. And the reason this approach is better uh, is because it focuses on the process as opposed to just the outcome. Again, it signals more interest than just picking off the shelf some flavor of the month technology. Uh, shows depth over just, you know, buzzword maxing. Um, and really fundamentally, the thing you want to do is you want to signal originality over these low effort copy paste projects. And this is again, why I think it's so important for you to come up with your own project idea, as opposed to just get one uh, suggested for you. 
Now for research, this does mean that the project itself or the approach should be original, but for dev, it can just be the implementation. So you can, again, take some model that's already implemented in a bunch of places and you do it yourself, but better for some particular use case. Likewise, you could take some model off the shelf that is used for a bunch of financial instruments and you could maybe tune it to a very exotic derivative product or something. Uh, but I hope that this video helps. That does wrap things up. I think it's more or less self-explanatory. And if you follow this process here, I think you're bound to come up with a pretty good project idea. So I will wrap it up there. I hope this video was helpful to some of you, um, but I'll be signing off for today. So I'll just say thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a good rest of your day.